I didn't see bird points or either of those in your collection. I just well, saw they had a representation. Well, yeah. All of us. Then I got like the star and the camera, which are really, uh, really kind of small, yeah. and we're half it on and shot with the uh, arrow and bow and arrow. And some people call those bird points too. Yeah. Now uh, I'm not, I don't make a distinction from that, but I'm not really, uh, I don't really think there is from the bird to the arrow to to a small point like that. I haven't really arrow shafted uh, point. I really don't get much smaller than the camera or the star. So what timeline do you think the actual bow and arrow came into? It was about somewhere around 1,000, 1,100 AD. In this area, for sure. In this area. This area I'm talking about. Um, I heard someplace long time ago that the area around here called Los Indios where the bridge is was called that because it, it, there was a time in living history when, when Indians lived there. I know. I, I don't know anything about that story, but like uh, like you were saying, when the Spanish were coming here, and that there were definitely uh, indigenous people here, definitely, and some were you know before that they're here, but the other people were coming here to this area from pressures from their land being taken away and all that. I think a lot of those were the last Comanches that decided to try to fit in. And there, yeah, I, I can give you some books to look into. She was talking about the caches of uh, points and all that. It's strange. A lot of those are found archaeological, like they're storing them for uh, later. They, they made them and then they'll come back at some other point to, to get them. And they know it, you know. Some are also associated with burials like that, to where uh, they're ceremonial. But this, this person represented this. He was so much of a society, and we pay him homage by by burying them with these, because in the afterlife he'll need, need these. For the Indian, the problem in the, the uh, War of 1846 to 1848, coming in against the soldiers? No. Only out west for the Yeah, I mean, uh, there's stories after the Battle War of, uh, of uh, Comanche still coming down and raiding yeah. here. But as far as during the war and the battles, now there were possibly some guides and all that, but uh, they had a small impact into the armies and all that. Is that probably, uh, uh, of course, the, the Mexican army probably consisted of a lot of uh, Native Americans within their ranks. They enticed them over there by giving them land. Well, they were part of the country of Mexico. They'd already been, you know, brought in. Some, some assimilated, some mm -hmm. to certain degrees. We got some write-ups about those. How long ago was that? In the 30s. Oh, okay. It was, I I it was 28. <laughs> <laughs> it was 28 when they were putting the water lines in. But, um, Which, I mean, it, it doesn't surprise. Nobody knows where they are. Mm -hmm. But how can you tell, like, when you go out beach or whatever, and you see a lot of shells that have little holes in them, I mean, how do you know that they're not, that they're, you know, native? 
cylindrical scrape and all that. You study it closely, you should be able to differentiate with the you know, magnifying glass or microscope. We had this uh, arrowhead made out of ebony with, okay. the, with the brought in those, it has feathers, and it's ebony, but like, it's like, it has two. Was that from, I mean, it came out of a cave up in Rio Grande City. Okay, oh yeah. I'm, That's I'm like from the 1800s, I don't, I couldn't answer that. We have it on the scope. It's in, in wonderful condition. But it has the feathers in the back, and it's, it's ebony wood, you can tell, and it's like. The feathers are a feather or wood? The feathers. Mm -hmm. Where is there an ebony for? Oh, they're all. Oh, that was the indigenous tree. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I mean, the ebony here goes all the way up. Yeah, <laughs> and mesquite during the 19th and 20th century have really boomed in population uh, because of human impacts and all that. Really, it's one of those invasive species. It's native; it is a native species, but due to human activities, it has become more of a dominant species than uh, some, some of the other. Well, we went to the Welder Institute up there by Beyond Corpus, and they told us that mesquite was not actually native of the area. Isn't there a church somewhere in the valley that exactly have mesquite doors for the Yankee boys? Oh, yeah. So I guess they brought them with It the depends on, yeah, uh, well. Of course, this was Corpus Christi and North of Corpus Christi, maybe. I mean, to me, in the Tomalip and Brushland, the mesquite is a part of that. Because, it just yeah, changed. It just, just changed. And, and really, the Delta is part of the Tomalip and Brush, although it's a little, a unique little pocket because of uh, its proximity to the Gulf and all that too. And that's where we you know we had the, the stable palm forest down here also, which is you don't find anywhere else in the, the Tom Leap and Brushland area. What what plants is there evidence of them using? <laughs> um, let me see. Well mesquite, ebony ebony bean pods, and that's a tough one because really uh uh, there needs to be a lot more study, a lot more scientific study, pollen analysis dug from, uh, you know, stratified side to side to really get into that. But uh, there had to be some unique plants here. Uh, probably the the fibrous, like the the Spanish dagger, the agave, they used a lot of that too, and extracting the fiber from that for to make cordage and uh, sandals and so. on. Similar things to that with the ebony, also yeah. the ebony bean. When it was when the, when it was in the green state, yeah. uh, they boil it down and uh, wash the pod and, and put it and uh, roast it and then eat the bean like they eat peanuts. And what you were saying about the tinklers, right? Yeah. They had coyote tinklers. Uh huh. That's always been a problem on the island. <laughs> they used to have coyote hunts back in the twenties, and they're still having problems. Now. So there must have been lots of coyotes. Should have been a lot more tinklers. <laughs> well, there's if there's nothing else. Nobody has any questions. Uh, I really thank you for your attention and for coming out here. And uh, 
Yeah, it'll still be available for a little while. Okay. Let me Thank you me, very much. Just for the record, so I could record because we didn't record it earlier. Uh, this is Thursday, uh, September 30th, and our speaker was Loran, Rolando Garza with the Palo Alto Battlefield Historical Site. And we thank everyone for coming tonight. Our next uh, telling our story is going to be November, the last Thursday. It's going to be Steve Hathcock and Rod Bates, I believe so, <laughs> speaking about the 1554 shipwrecks. And we'd like to thank the uh, uh, Laguna Marta Museum Foundation for uh, hosting the refreshments tonight. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Valerie Bates, for being our camera woman. <laughs> okay, thank you.